Test in Diplomacy, Success Cases for uh, COB25. So I will stop sharing my screen uh, and please sh uh, start share your screen. I would like first to thank uh, Dr. Walla for uh, this uh, opportunity. I, I would like to confirm that you can hear uh, my, my mic fine and that you can see my screen uh, fine as well. Yes, uh, I, I, I can hear you. And you okay. can, uh, now it's, uh, it's showing in a perfect way. Okay, Go ahead, good. you. Okay. Okay, good. So yes, I, I I would like to thank Dr. Walla for this opportunity and all the organizers. I would like to thank and uh, say hello to all the participants today and my share, my dear colleagues and panelists that will be joining us today. It's a great pleasure to start talking. When I was invited to participate in this workshop, I was very honored and pleased and pleased because so far uh, I have been following science diplomacy for 10 years and most of the talks and most of the workshops and literature are about um, the global north. So I think that we really need to support these kind of actions that is, in this case, supported by Dr. Walla in order to make the voice of the global south heard, right? So that we can also participate in the science diplomacy community, providing a perspective from our part of the world, from the global south. And just to make the point that the science diplomacy is not only something from the global north, but it's, on, but it's also a field where the global south can contribute quite a lot. So in my case, I will present bri very briefly a quick introduction about what science diplomacy is. And then later, <coughs> so I apologize for that. And then later I will present a very uh, short success case about science diplomacy, which is the COP25 case. And uh, well, if some of you are, are the ones that are following today, this uh, workshop are not, are not yet aware of, of the concept of science diplomacy, I would like you to tell you that uh, science diplomacy is still a work in progress concept. So, uh, and if you have not heard about it before, do not worry, that is fine because it's kind of new. It's, uh, the first time that the concept was coined, it was around 10 years ago. So if you are not aware of the concept, that is also fine, don't worry. That is why that is why we are here in order to let you know and promote and uh, raise awareness or build awareness about the concept of sign diplomacy. Definitions for sign diplomacy, you will find many. And if uh, but if, if we can do it very briefly, I would say that science diplomacy is an intersection between two spheres that hardly often talk to each other. Two spheres that traditionally are not com uh, communicating to each other. So in, on one hand, we have the sphere related to research, to science, technology, and on the other hand, we have the sphere related to uh, foreign affairs, to diplomacy, to international relations and the international community. If you feel like uh, going, browsing some more definitions and concepts about science diplomacy, I would strongly suggest you all to visit this website that I have written in red right here s 4 d 4 ceu and there you will find a lot of uh, definitions and more expl explanations about the what is science diplomacy. Uh, okay, so let me go to the next slide. Yes, 
And, and uh, as I was saying, science diplomacy is a kind of all wine in a new bottle, if I may. <laughs> because it's a new concept that describes a very old practice. It is new because the first time that this concept received a taxonomy was in the year 2010 by this um, do, this do, document entitled New Frontiers in Science Diplomacy, which was elaborated by two organizations of the civil society, the AAAS in the United States and the Royal Society of London. So you can see this uh, document was elaborated in the year 2010, which is not that old, but it refers to a practice that it is indeed very ancient. As an example, uh, you can see uh, here on the screen the Kadesh Treaty, which was signed between Egypt and the Hittite Empire almost around 3,000 years ago. And this is the first peace treaty in the history of humanity. And it included in the text one uh, uh, part of, of it related to already to science and technology. So you can see that along history, many, many uh, actions or events can be observed through the lenses of science diplomacy, including this one, the first uh, peace treaty ever signed between two nations. And I'm going to go for the next slide. Uh, yeah, here. So I'm going to focus my presentation in this um, definition of science diplomacy provided by this document that I've just mentioned, the document entitled New Frontiers in Science Diplomacy, because it's the one that first provided a taxonomy for science diplomacy. And it refers to the role of science, technology, and innovation to three different areas. The first one is related to the, infor the informing process of foreign policy objectives with scientific advice. The second role in this taxonomy is to facilitate the international science cooperation between different nations. And the third role that was described in these documents is the using of science cooperation in order to improve the international relations between countries. So as you can see from these three roles, we can easily uh, see the three dimensions of science diplomacy according to this uh, publication. The first dimension is science in diplomacy. And this one refers to the fact of how does science inform the foreign policy making process. Then the second dimension, the name is diplomacy for science. And it tackles the question, how does diplomacy support the advancement of science, technology, and innovation? The name of the third dimension of this taxonomy is science for diplomacy. And it's related to the question, how does science, technology, and innovation support the improvement of international relations. So after this quick introduction to science diplomacy concept, I will present to you a success case related to the first dimension of science diplomacy, uh, which is the COP25 uh, process. So this uh, is an initiative that easily fits into the first dimension of science diplomacy, the one that is called science in diplomacy. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go for my next slide. Yeah, here. So what is the COP process? Actually, 
if you haven't heard about the cup process, uh, it's because it's um, it's not that covered by by the mass media or the press, but it is the most important summit on climate action around the the globe. It is it takes place annually uh, by the United Nations framework framework convention on climate change and the word COP stands for conference of the parties and these parties are 196 plus the participation of the european union during these uh, summits the decisions are taken by consensus among the partners and all these negotiations lead to one single huge umbrella purpose which is to stabilize the rise of greenhouse gas emissions if you haven't heard about uh, the COP process you might be uh, aware or you might have read in the press these two cops that are um, more uh, covered by the press back then during the time that, that they were taking place you might remember the COP3, which took place in the year 1997. And during this uh, COP3, the Kyoto Protocol was agreed. If you, if you remember, this Kyoto Protocol said the objective of reducing the country emissions by 5%. And also, one more recent example is a COP24 one which is the one that took place in paris in the year 2015 and during this cop the paris agreement was uh decided was agreed with the goal of limiting the global temperature to rise to no more than two degrees by the year 2100 so these are the two cups that are um, widely known um, across the across the globe. And well, so this cup is the summit that takes place annually, and in the year uh, twenty nineteen, it was the, um, the the opportunity for Latin American and the Caribbean region to host this global summit and it was uh, the Chilean authorities decided to go for it and host this uh, climate uh, summit here in, in Chile. So you can see from the very start from the Chilean presidency of COP25, the, the organizer state that the science is not negotiable and it should be the basis for making decisions and finding solutions for climate action. As a result of these uh, engagements, the COP25 recognized that the climate action must be based on the best scientific knowledge available. So you can see that during the, the um, uh, arrangement phase, the, the COP25 presidency adopted a vision for it. A vision that was rather long, but here I would just present a brief, a brief paragraph uh, within this vision that, uh, that described that the COPE must encourage the concrete climate action, ensuring an inclusive process for all parties and the formal integration of the scientific world and the private sector. So you can see that in this text that from the very beginning of the Chilean presidency of COP25, uh, it was decided that the scientific community would have an important role uh, in this action. So in order to fulfill this engagement, the Chilean presidency set up this uh, COP25 scientific committee that you can see here, which uh, brought together over 600 researchers 
from different fields uh, who were organized by seven key areas to face climate change. And these seven areas were Antarctica, oceans, water, biodiversity, cities, energy, and finally, the, the final area was adaptation and mitigation. These 600 plus researchers received a mandate of identifying the scientific evidence and provide recommendations that support the design of public policies for climate action. So you can see that this was the, the huge pur purpose to these 600 researchers to browse all the information in order to extract the best scientific evidence that would be suitable for the policy making process about climate action. And now I'm going for the next slide. Yes. Here. As a result of this um, scientific com committee supporting the COP25 presidency, uh, this report that I'm uh, presenting now uh, was elaborated. The title is Scientific Evidence and Climate change in Chile, a summary for decision takers. This was the huge uh, input that was provided by these 600 researchers scientific committee, and it reports 188 proposals plus recommendations for the generation of capacities, the development of regulatory actions, plus the strengthening of information for plans and policies related to climate action. So you see this this um, this report is quite broad. If you feel like uh, reading it, you might find it in this website that is written in red at the bottom of my screen. You will also be able to find a version of it in English. And I would like to present just two achievements that I observe from this doc from this document. The first achievement that I would uh, point out is that this report played an important role in the text and the final text of the COP conclusions, in which the science and the, and the science and this, the evidence were highlighted as one of the fundamental inputs in order to strengthen and stimulate the climate action. And the second achievement that I would extract, that I would point out from this document is that it was finally recognized the importance of an unstructured dialogue of experts that support the negotiation process during the COP processes. So you see, this is something that would uh, remain in the future COPs. Um, the COP uh, 2020 could not take place due to the pandemic, COVID-19. But the, the relay will be passed to the COP 26, which will take place in Glasgow at the United Kingdom. And some of these recommendations will also be part of those next uh, negotiations. Uh, finally, I, I would like to thank you for inviting me, for having me here. If you feel like uh, reading more about science diplomacy or more success cases from a perspective of the global south, and if you can speak uh, Spanish, <laughs> uh, with <laughs> us, I suggest you to visit our network, Diplo Científica, the Latin American network for science diplomacy. You will find our website here, diplomaciacientifica.org. And you might also find uh, more uh, information about science diplomacy in Latin America if you follow our social uh, networks. However, if you do not 
you do not speak uh, Spanish, I would uh, suggest to go to the um, S4D4C website that I mentioned at the beginning. And there you will also find uh, plenty of information and very well elaborated, very, very well written, very attractively designed in order to better understand the concept of client diplomacy, what it is and what it is not. Thank you once again, Dr. Walla, for this invitation. And I'm fully open to receive your question or to keep on participa participating and contributing to this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, dear uh, Dr. Petro, for your very interested um, lecture. And uh, I, I like uh, your work. Yes, you did uh, a lot of work. And uh, not only in Spanish, we can talk in English also <laughs> to join. So if any, any uh, uh, participant have any question, you can raise your hand and uh, I can open the camera to uh, to uh, ask your question to Dr. Petro. So he, we have two minutes. So also uh, I want to uh, uh, notify that we have uh, open session for discussion uh, at the end of the day, first day. So also please uh, uh, all um, speakers uh, will can, can join.